Shalom. We are today sitting with uh, Rabbi Richman at Temple Institute in our eternal capital, Jerusalem. Uh, Rabbi Richman, I have, uh, this is an honor to sit here with you. Uh, first and foremost, I'm glad that you, you would take your time to, to uh, sit down and um, tell us more and give us more insights about your crucial um, engagement and commitment to, to one of the most important things in, in, the, in the Jewish agenda right now and in the Zionist agenda, of course. So first and foremost, thanks so much for having us. So um, tell us more about uh, the Temple Institute. Temple Institute is a non-profit, religious, educational, apolitical um, uh, organization whose goal is really to um, fulfill the commandment of Exodus 25, 8, and they shall make for me a sanctuary, and I will dwell among them, as best as humanly possible in our time. Um, the, the goal of the Institute is to be as occupied as possible with the whole concept of the Holy Temple, what it means for the Jewish people, what it means for all humanity. This is not really about a building. It's not like some sort of uh, cult that's obsessed with architecture. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not about a building, it's about a concept. The concept of the Holy Temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, as Isaiah the prophet says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. It's a concept that uh, all of humanity can be elevated to a sense of divine purpose and that mankind's greatest goal is simply to understand that we all have one common father and that there is a divine purpose to life. And everything that happens in the Holy Temple is uh, a, a very um, visceral, um, um, uh, challenging experience where a person really begins to understand there really is a God in this world. Uh, th there's a statement that the sages of Israel make in the chapters of the fathers that there are ten miracles going on all the time in the second temple. The idea is that every person, even if they're not necessarily a spiritual giant, a person comes to the holy temple, realizes, has those batteries rejuvenated and renewed and refreshed and, and realize that uh, I really have a special relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So uh, on a national level, the Jewish people have a destiny. Mm -hmm. The destiny of the Jewish people is to bring the light of God into the world. On the level of uh, all of humanity, uh, it's funny, uh, you know, the, the, the topic is politically charged because the, the, um, to be diplomatic, uh, the, the location of the Holy Temple, which is decided by the God of Israel, is currently occupied by a different geopolitical reality. So people say, oh, you talk about building the Holy Temple, you're going you're to cause a world war. But Haggai, the prophet, says that God says, in this place I will grant peace. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the Holy Temple is the secret of peace for all mankind and, and fulfillment. And ironically, when the Temple stood, all nations were welcome to pray there. And now... Uh, with the Temple Mount controlled by Islam, uh, all non-Muslim expression of prayer is forbidden at the Temple Mount, which is, goes against the democracy of the State of Israel. But I have to tell you this, you know, the, the Bible says that the Jews are the chosen people. Now, a lot of people might be uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. I personally don't recall getting the chance to fill out a form. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask for that title. But what does it mean? you see, because many Jewish people spend their lives running from that because it makes them so uncomfortable. Being the chosen people doesn't mean that we are the best uh, uh, Wall Street brokers, film producers, uh, and uh, gynecologists. We happen to be that also, but it's a coincidence. Mm -hmm. What it means to be the chosen people is it's a responsibility, mm -hmm. not a privilege, because God chose the Jewish people to be the vehicle by which all of humanity learns that there's only one God. And in that saga, the Holy Temple plays a major and central role. Mm -hmm. So at the Temple Institute, we um, have been engaged for almost 30 years now in all manner of research, education, publication, about this very difficult and complicated uh, and expertise area of study. Mm -hmm. We are preparing as best as possible for the actual building of the temple by 
uh, first and foremost, the preparation of the vessels that can actually be used in the temple. They are not models or copies or replicas. They are made according to every nuance of biblical law, kosher for use, so that they could actually be used. And this is considered by Jewish law like the first stage of actually building the temple. We also uh, create educational uh, curriculum and we're doing many other science and research related projects. And it's all geared towards the concept of being actively involved in the commandment of the rebuilding of the temple, which we believe is an eternal commandment. We don't believe that the temple is going to come down from heaven. We don't believe that it's passé. We don't believe that it is the uh, purview of the Messiah. We believe that all of Israel are commanded to build the temple. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously that is uh, seen by many as a politically uh, charged statement because uh, that seems to be confrontational regarding the reality today. But you know, uh, if you take a case like uh, Iran, where uh, the Iranians uh, have been talking about destroying Israel twice a week for, the, for as long as I remember, and I didn't even build the temple, so I might as well for the same money. What I'm trying to say is um, the very existence of the Jewish people is considered by many people to be provocative. Mm -hmm. So when people say to me, you know, you talk about the rebuilding of the temple, that's a bit provocative. So as so, a so bottom line, uh, Rabbi Richman, we have unfortunately uh, a Muslim worship house on, on the Temple Mount um, called the, what do you call it? Well, the, the, the actual house of worship is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, Al Mosque, which is on the southern portion of the Temple Mount that faces Mecca. On the site of the Holy of Holies is, it's not an actual functioning mosque, it's a shrine called the, shrine. the Dome of the Rock. The Dome right. of the Rock, right. So, 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 so basically, um, if we, we're going to talk about the, the real things here on the ground, of course Israel gives the Muslims the right to to pray and be a part of the Israeli society. We have 54 or 55, if I'm not uh, wrong now, Muslim Islamic nations. We have one Jewish state. Why are we submitting uh, into this Islamic radicalism once again? They are destroying Jewish antiquities on the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. And Jew, we Jews were not allowed to, to pray on, on one of the, the, the most holiest ground where we now have the right of sovereignty on a legal aspect, practical and technical. Why are we once again submitting into the most radical, inhumane uh, segment of, of humanity? So let me explain to you. First of all, I want to qualify my, my last statement. and I'm, I'm talking about wanting to build a temple. Now, as a Jew, I'm not going to apologize for the fact that we want to build a temple because that's what we've been praying for for three times a day for 2,000 years, and it's a very basic concept in Judaism. That is the one place that the God of Israel chose, and it says in the Torah, tens of times, the place that I will choose, the place that I will show you. Abraham was taken to that place. Jacob laid his head on that place and saw the ladder. Abraham bound Isaac. And the two temples together stood for over 800 years on that place and formed a very vibrant part of the timeline of all humanity that's undeniable. And the fact is, though, that uh, today Islam denies that there ever was a temple or that Jews have any rights there. But I, w I want to qualify that when I talk about building the temple, you know, I don't believe that this would come about through any sort of violence or confrontation. Mm -hmm. I believe, very simply, that if the Jewish people were the people that we're supposed to be, really bringing light to the, to the, to the nations. You know, Zechariah says that ten men from the nations will grab hold of the corner of a Jew and say, can we go with you because we heard that God is with you, right? If we become those people, then they will come to us and they will say, please bring the temple. We don't know what to do with this mountain. We messed up. Please build the temple and bring the light of Hashem into the world. Now, Here's the thing. Uh, I went to the Temple Mount this morning. I go many, many times, a few times a week for many, many years. There is a very ironic situation on the Temple Mount that even though officially Israel is in control of the Temple Mount, as echoed by those immortal words of General Matagor in June 7, 1967, Har Habayit Biyadeinu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Actually, it isn't. Mm -hmm. Actually, all non-Muslims, Christians included, who visit the Temple Mount and want to express themselves religiously are considered at best 
to be unwelcome guests, and at worst to be like a mosquito that has to be flicked away. So we're not allowed to, to actually prey on the government. Now, this is Israel. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. And according to the Supreme Court, the High Court of Justice of the State of Israel, every person has the right to pray in every holy place, including the Temple Mount. And the Supreme Court has upheld this time after time that there must be a permanent solution, must be found to enable non-Muslims to pray at the Temple Mount. However, in practice, the fine print of that writ of the Supreme Court is that the Israel police are empowered to interpret what will constitute incitement to violence. And the Israel police consistently decided that every non-Muslim expression of religious sentiment at the site is uh, incitement to violence. So, for example, when a kippah-wearing Jew comes to the Temple Mount, even if I bring with me non-Jews, Christians, but they're in my group because they're with me, the procedure that they have in visiting the Temple Mount is completely different than ordinary tourists who are not identified visibly as being Jews. When we go to the Temple Mount, we have to identify ourselves with uh, a government-issued photo ID. No other tourist has to. And then we have to be approved. And then we get a whole warning from the police who tell us like this. They say, remember, no praying, no moving your lips, no closing your eyes, no singing, no crying, no moving your body, no... no dancing, no doing anything that could be interpreted as prayer. If you are seen doing that, you will be arrested. When we go to the Temple Mount, we are accompanied by uh, the Israel police and a contingent of the Muslim waqf, who are a foreign agent. They are employed by Jordan. They receive a salary from Jordan. And they are entrusted to make sure that no non-Muslims try to pray. If they suspect that we're moving our lips, they will tell the police to arrest us, and that, will, that is what will happen. All this because they are insisting that uh, Jews are polluting uh, their holy place by coming there. Um, according to the 1994 peace accords with Jordan, unfortunately, it seems to, even though it says that Israel and Jordan will uphold the right of everyone to pray everywhere and free and equal access and all these beautiful terminology, um, it also recognizes what's called the unique uh, role of Jordan as being the custodian of the holy places. And unfortunately, for all practice and purpose right now, we say as much as we like that Harabait uh, Biadenu, that we control the Temple Mount, but Jordan is really sovereign on the Temple Mounts. Unfortunately, several generations were raised since 1967 and those miracles. They were raised being told, this is not our place, this is an Islamic holy site. We have nothing to do with this place. But happily, I can tell you that, it, that, that the past few years, there is a tremendous increase in Jewish visits to the Temple Mount. Hundreds and hundreds of Jews a day are going to the Temple Mount and demanding the right to pray. There is a lobby of at least 12 young, vibrant Knesset members, mm -hmm. Moshe Feiglin, Sipi Chatuveli, mm -hmm. Miri Regev, Danny Danone, who are speaking out in favor of Jewish prayer legislation to enable Jews to pray on the Temple Mount. The irony of, of this image that I'm painting for you, that we should be treated like felons mm -hmm. when we go to the only place in the world where we're actually commanded to pray, right? The Temple Mount not mentioned once in the Quran. Jerusalem, Jerusalem mentioned over 700 times in the Bible of Israel and not mentioned once in the Quran. But yet when we go to the Temple Mount, we are like, uh, considered to be, as I mentioned, like unwelcome guests. And yes, there has been a concerted effort waged by the forces of Islam for many years to utterly destroy and demolish and erase uh, every vestige of shred of evidence of the Temple from the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. This has been going on for many years, and that campaign uh, accelerated in the year 2000 when uh, tens of thousands of remnants of the Second and even the First Temple subterraneously mm -hmm. were purposely destroyed. Mm -hmm. This is something of which even secular professors and archaeologists here in the state of Israel are up in arms about. Mm -hmm. It's become like some sort of diplomatic immunity, like some sort of Vatican city-state where we have no authority there whatsoever. We have given over the authority. Mm -hmm. Is it because of a fear of the specter of Muslim unrest? Is it because of weak leadership? Every successive uh, prime minister in Israel from the time of Levi Eshkol has reacted the same way to the Temple Mount as some sort of liability, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Today, that's not going to go anymore. It's not going to hold water because there is a young generation of Jews that are risking it all, pushing the envelope, and coming there with great dedication, 
to, to pray. And the truth is, this whole story is a story of uh, human rights. This is, we keep saying, our undivided eternal capital. I mentioned to you, Jerusalem, not mentioned in the Quran. This is the one place on earth where we are commanded to pray. Do you know that if Jews were treated the way they're treated on the Temple Mount, if they were treated that way in a European country, the state of Israel would lodge a formal complaint and write a letter and claim anti-Semitism about the way Jews are being treated. When we go to the Temple Mount, we are treated like criminals, suspect, we are followed, we are, we are watched like this by these forces with walkie-talkies to see, did he move his lips? Did he try to pray? Crazy. But what's crazier is this. Let me tell you what's really crazy. The body which governs over the administration on the Temple Mount is called the Supreme Muslim Council or Trust. It's the Waqf. It's the same body that's been governing for many, many years. And in 1967, once again, we gave them the authority. Here, I show you a guide, an original booklet that was published by the Waqf, the same Waqf that is in control of the Temple Mount today, published in 1930. Mm -hmm. I have also co a copy from 1923. This is from 1930, published by the Supreme Muslim Council. It's an English guidebook to the Temple Mount, a brief guide to Al-Haram al-Sharif Jerusalem. This was published not before 1967, but before 1948, before the establishment of the State of Israel. Now you know that the official position of Islam today mm. is that there never was a temple. This is called temple denial syndrome. And, and they say that the Jews are trying to Judaize Jerusalem, right? Abbas, who has a doctorate in Holocaust denial. Mm. They say that we made up the whole story, there never was a temple. And of course, how could you deny something that every scholar, layman, preacher, clergyman, academic knows was such an important part of the experience of all humanity? That's the difference between saying something and doing something about it, because as I mentioned, they've also been destroying. Mm -hmm. But here, 1930, published in Jerusalem, a brief guide to Al-Haram al-Sharif Jerusalem, published by the Supreme Muslim Council. Let's read. On every side, trees break the prospect which lend a peculiar charm to the scene. The site is one of the oldest in the world. Its sanctity dates from the earliest, perhaps from prehistoric times. Its identity with the site of Solomon's temple is beyond dispute. This, too, is the spot, according to the universal belief, quoting Samuel 24, 25, on which David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. This from the mouth of Islam before the establishment of the State of Israel, because the templates of Islam is that they're never interested in a place until we come back. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they're very interested. Look at photographs of the Temple Mount. From, this here is one from 1910. Mm -hmm. Look at photographs from the turn of the century, from the early years of the state, and you'll see complete disinterest, neglect, mm -hmm. gone to seed. There was no interest. Mm -hmm. The same booklet published not after 1967, but after the establishment of the state here, 1954. They change it there? The same booklet. Now it says, that page is gone that I just read to you about the universal belief, universally acknowledged, beyond dispute. Mm -hmm. Haram al Sharif, noble sanctuary, is the religious center of the Muslims of the Middle East and second only to Mecca in the Muslim world. The Prophet himself spoke of Al Aqsa, the original name for the place, and according to tradition, made a miraculous journey to it. Thus, it has been identified with Islam from its beginning. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, this is called revisionist history. Mm -hmm. But note again, this is not after 67, it's after 48. Mm -hmm. Because the problem was never the territories or the settlements. The problem is that we are home now, we exist all together. And that is the great provocation, mm -hmm. that the Jewish people have not yet died. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you um, bring out to European leaders and most of all anti-Israeli uh, political legislators that try to delegitimize the state of Israel and demonize the Jewish people when it comes to this critical and crucial uh, issue of, of rebuilding uh, the Third Temple. Uh, just break it down in a few words, even though it's difficult, but for us it's very important to bring out this important I understand, message. and I'm not, I'm not a politician. I mean, as far as I can see, once again, before we get to this crucial matter of the temple, Israel is demonized and delegitimized just for existing altogether. Obviously, when it comes to our divinely appointed task, which is such a challenge to people's lifestyle, such a challenge to people's thinking, the idea that uh, one will be held responsible for one's actions, the idea that, uh, look, this week was just the festival of Shavuot, 
what is the idea of all nations coming to the Holy Temple and recognizing God in their lives and acknowledging? This brings with it a moral code. And the bottom line of the Jewish experience is all about personal responsibility for making the world into a better place. Mm -hmm. Who wants to hear about that today in our time of total uh, uh, hedonism and permissiveness and everything, everything that has become, uh, has happened to family values? I want to tell you a story. But, and this is how I'll answer your question. I, I personally, again, um, have no interest in defending Israel. I think it's high time that we stop defending ourselves in the public uh, national, international forum. We exist. Uh, do, what other country uh, has to prove itself constantly mm -hmm. and has to beg people to like its page and has to, be, and has to say, come to this rally and, and vote in favor of this? Who cares? Mm -hmm. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Uh, apologizing to anyone. Mm. You know how Israel brings world leaders, the Pope was just here, mm. they bring world leaders and they show them Yad Vashem. Mm. You know everybody loves dead Jews, so the Pope stood there very, very reverentially. You know what? You're the one who put us in the ground, mm. right? Your legacy. They bring all these leaders to Yad Vashem because they just love it. They love that the Jews have suffered so much. You know what? If I was Prime Minister, I think we should bring these leaders to Demona. I think we should bring them to the nuclear plant. I think we should bring them to the Air Force, place, the Air, the Air, the Air Force bases. And I think we should say to them, you know what? This is who we are now. Mm -hmm. Understand? This is what we can do. That was then. This is the way it is now. You like it? Fine. You don't like it? We're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. We're not going anywhere. But here's the story. Mm -hmm. June 7th, 1967. My rabbi, the founder of the Temple Institute, was one of the paratroopers who liberated the Temple Mount. Amazing story, right? You can imagine the tremendous emotion for these young men on the Temple Mount after so many years. And um, he, he relates the story that the soldiers were there, and they're approached by a Jordanian in Western dress who was the official uh, delegate of the Jordanian parliament who would be showing uh, VIPs around. He took the soldiers. June 7, 1967, he says to them, let me show you around, he says, this is where the sanctuary stood. This is where the menorah stood. This is where the altar stood. Different from today, which mm. is completely denial. And the soldiers asked him, why are you telling us this? He said, we have a tradition from our fathers mm. that one day the Jews will wage a war mm. and capture this mountain and begin to rebuild the Holy Temple. And I assume that you're starting tomorrow. So this is what was expected of us, and this mm. is what's still expected of us. And it was only when I heard that story that I understood everything that's happened to us because we, we need to behave the way a people should behave. We have our divine mandate and this is the eternal land of the Jewish people. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Richman, for this um, insight. And uh, we will definitely bring back your crucial message to European leaders that try to unfortunately delegitimize the state of Israel and uh, the only democracy in the Middle East and to our viewers, uh, we would like to bring uh, Rabbi Richmond's uh, insights from the Temple Institute. Don't forget about this critical and crucial, important issue. And let's all hope and pray for the uh, rebuilding of the Third Temple as soon as possible. Rabbi Richmond, thank you so much. Thank you.